that the subject is audacity, and it says little Patuxent review. It's like this very humble, it's like a little engine that should or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's like you really have, no, the, the audacity, uh, I guess such a modest uh, uh, advertised publication, little, you know, maybe you ought to call it the great Patuxent review or something. Anyhow, I was going to talk about it. I wanted to be a poet when I started off, a writer. And I met a girl in New Orleans, and she decided, writer you already are, we'll make a painter out of you. So I started painting. It was, I always could draw and that sort of thing. And uh, I started doing, in the New Orleans, I started doing caricatures of people in Pirate's Alley. Anybody ever been to New Orleans or New Pirate's Alley? I got a license, and everybody uh, would tear them up because I'm an uglifier. As Al Hansen used to say, I'm an uglifier. <laughs> so my uh, girlfriend put a sign up, Mirror Maid, see how you turn out. And I charged 50 cents you know, in these caricatures. So I was trying to draw people straight, actually. And they still tore them up. I remember I would go around the bars at night and try to do caricatures to try to make 50 cents here and there. And uh, I actually sold one to a guy. And I got up, and I was drinking beer to meet the guy I just sold the drawing to, shake his hand, but I forgot to uh, keep my beer bottle in the vertical position so that the beer <laughs> bottle took a kind of egregious leak over the trousers of my first painter. <laughs> so I guess I can't really uh, drink beer and uh, draw at the same time, or at least meet the patrons. And my mother sent me some money. I was young then, of course, and was... See, when I got out of college, I went to Montana with a cowboy. Then I was going around the country for a couple years, doing odd jobs, wound up in New Orleans. So it wasn't quite the thing that my parents really wanted for their son. So uh, I took the money. It was $20 and bought some art supplies out of box. And I went down on the, uh, by St. Jack Jackson's Brewery. Was it Jackson's Brewery off the wharf near Decatur Street? And uh, actually, I met uh, a wino down there. He was he was uh, asleep on a piece of cardboard down there. I kind of woke him up, and I was rolling a cigarette. And he says, "You got the makings. Haven't let him pop roll a cigarette." So I let him roll a cigarette, and then he told me these incredible stories. Like, I mean, this was 1955, so. Way back when he was a young man, he was an old codger. He was where he was with Pershing, General Pershing down in Mexico. He was being pursued by Pancho Villa. And I said, uh, what's Pancho Villa like? He said, oh, he's a little guy, always rode a white horse. Prince of a guy. That's about as deep as he got into characterization. But then he went to a bar and he found out the Mexicans were making more money than he was, so he deserted the American army and, and joined the forces with Pancho Villa. And then the First World War was declared, and he's still very patriotic. So he went back to his regiment, and he said, nobody said beans to me. And he joined Pershing and for the American Expeditionary Force in Europe. So that's how open and loose the United States Army was in those days. So I was there paying after we made our formal inductions and so forth. I started to paint. I had, to paint. I had a little chair. Do you ever see those little chairs that fold open and then they're yeah. stitched? And uh, I sat on the chair, and I, there was a lot of wind coming across the Mississippi River, and I put my foot in the, in the box and moved things aside so it would hold the box. And the lid of the box was up, and I had to act on the lid of canvas, and I started to make this painting. Whoops. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the stitching, due to my own bon point, my bottom or own bon point, came out of the seat. My ass hit the ground. My feet went up. The wind took with the lid, took all my paints and blew them into the Mississippi River. And I knew God was telling me something. I don't know why I'm still in this field. I should have either stayed as a horseman or a poet. I could put everything on a... I got all this storage problem now. I could put everything up on a CD disc or something. That would have been great. <laughs> what else can I tell you about starting off as an artist? <laughs> I want to thank everybody. Is Michael here who wrote this article? I haven't read it. Did Michael show up? Saltzman? No. Didn't show up. I guess uh, I meet him in a health club every so often and we talk about aesthetics. There are a couple things about aesthetics I really like. 
like what Keats said. He said, poetry should surprise by fine excess rather than singularity. Isn't that a great line? Of course, we live in a singularity kind of epic with uh, post postmodern, you know, reductive uh, kind of aesthetics, you know, conceptualism and stuff like that. And I go the other way, I guess. I like the full medium. I like the richness of the full medium and so forth. You know, like to have the, you know, the paint speak. It's like when Howard May he had this, uh, he had these Tuesday evenings and they got would attend it. They got with poetry. I don't know if you knew that. And he was strong. He wrote about racehorses and ballerinas. And he painted ba uh, ballerinas and racehorses. And he said to Val May, he said, Monsieur, I'm, I, I, I don't like for ideas. I've been struggling with it, but I had trouble this week. I don't, I don't like for ideas, but and the poetry hadn't been going well. And Val May said, you of all people should know that poems are made with words, not ideas. Which I thought was kind of interesting. I remember what T.S. Eliot said about Henry James. You all know that, right? He had a mind so fine that no idea could violate it. <laughs> so, um, I hope when you look at my paintings that you don't uh, inadvertently stumble upon an idea, but if you do, I make my apologies. <laughs> okay, that's about it.